Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 861. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 7, 2024. Welcome to another episode. We're glad you could join us. This is where Kevin and George sit down in front of our webcams right here. Boom, boom, boom. And talk about things we find interesting in Anglicanism, the news around the world, politics, and all the whatnots out there. And we're glad you could join us. Before we get to all that, I need you guys to do us a favor and click the like button uh, on YouTube and Facebook. It's, it's got a, a little thumbs up. But this is what it looks like. This is a, a graphical representation of what you're going to click on. And uh, it's free advertising for us. It tells Facebook and YouTube that this is a worthy thing that they will promote for us, and that's free advertising. If you're not subscribed to this program and you don't get instant updates every time I upload a new episode, a great opportunity to click that little red button right there. Subscribe to the show. Red button. It's a red rectangle. Subscribe to the show, and you will be pleased to get instant uh, informed content weekly. Let's see, what else I gotta tell you to do? Oh, share this with friends, family, and foe. They, they will they will love you for it. Uh, because you're, you're, it's June, you're coming out of the closet. Uh, you, you're saying, I love Anglican Unscripted. I, I need to let people know that. And we appreciate that. George, uh, I'm, let you, quick life update here. I'm in Idaho now. Idaho is not the desert of Utah or Arizona where I was before. Idaho has pollen. You'll, you'll hear my voice is just a little deeper. We're headed north to Boise next week. Um, but the, the adventures continue for Sasquatch, Jill, and Kevin. Uh, how you been doing, George? Well, I got to say, Kevin, there is no better life than that of a parish priest. And that uh, in my personal life, uh, there's some health issues that have arisen in my family. And I have responded to those because there's, I'm not a doctor and there's not much I can do about it mm -hmm. by fully engaging with the opportunities to love and serve that comes in parish ministry. And I got to tell you, it's the best medicine there is mm -hmm. when you're able to share God's love and to be there and to help. It not only provides for needs in other people, it also soothes your own soul. So if I were, if I didn't have this work that I'm called to do, I'd be, a, I'd be a wreck, <laughs> but because, no, but because, it's true. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Yeah. But, be, but here I am, um, I'm, I'm very, I'm at peace. I'm calm. I'm worried about some issues, but over that worry is a, a supreme confidence that God is in charge and that all shall be well. Yeah. I mean, that's the big thing. You and I have both been ripped out of our comfort zones in the, in the last month. And I'm glad we're going through it together. Uh, it would be really hard for me to watch you do this uh, in the fall and I'm not being able to, to understand what you're going through. You and I know exactly what each other is going through. We, our pre-show is like, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, knowing what we're going through and knowing that uh, God is in charge and God is in control. And, it, it, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of each day, this will grow us, grow, grow us closer to our Lord and Savior and grow us closer as families. And uh, we look forward and we enjoy that opportunity. Uh, and mm -hmm. at, at this point, you know, a month into it, I want to go back. You know, I, I hate to say that, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. But uh, my faith is, is certainly yeah. closer. I don't think you mean geographically back. No, 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 it's no, no, in no, the no. mid-90s right now with about 90% humidity. And at yeah. 3 o'clock, it's going to rain. And I don't even need to look at the weather map <laughs> to don't. know that. Uh, we've yeah. started the summer here. Oh, geez, and yeah. everybody's run away up to the pleasant climbs of Idaho and places like that. Yeah. We left... Uh, um, Places in Arizona was 106 degrees in Tucson when we left. And that's just yeah, crazy. That's dry heat. That's dry, dry heat. heat. Yeah, dry heat, dry heat. Let's move on to the news. Oh, if you didn't hear what we're talking about, please keep your Anglican unscripted hosts in your prayers. Um, we value and we covet your prayers. George, you sent me a whole list of stories here. And for the 
for the Anglican unscripted viewer who is not in the, in the know, and that's like two of you, the Global South Assembly meets this week in Cairo, um, and they're going to meet to set up, hopefully, new structures uh, for the Anglican Communion. But in doing so, when you get together for the first time like this, you, you have to put together some formation of who you are, who speaks for you, what you're speaking about, and the context with which you do it. And it doesn't help to have some legal documentation to do this as well, George. The uh, About 150 delegates will be meeting at a St. Mark's Monastery in a suburb of Cairo called Sadat City. Mm -hmm. And they... Uh, the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans has 11 full provincial members, meaning provinces that have signed up. So it'll be at least 11 archbishops. Plus there'll be another half dozen up to a dozen uh, whose province uh, archbishops, you know, people like from Sydney, uh, where Australia is not a member, but certainly the Diocese of Sydney is. And um, people who are in the process of joining or thinking about it and whatnot. Now, the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans is following a, a, a trajectory, an organizational trajectory. Um, they are divided internally on some issues, uh, women's orders, um, uh, what we do about Justin Welby, um, but they're all agreed on the basics of the Christian faith. And they're in this stage now of setting up structures and organizations and ways in which to that, that they can eventually speak with one mind and that's not something that the opposition has been able to do for a long time so these are institution building times and the uh, press release put out by Renish Panaya former bishop of Singapore who's the secretary of the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans basically said this is a time to renew and reorganize the Anglican communion how do we understand the role of the Archbishop uh, of Canterbury? Mm -hmm. Should there be somebody who's not appointed by the Prime Minister of Great Britain to lead a religious organization? Uh, the answer is yes, it should yeah. not be a government appointee. Mm -hmm. But how do we get from here to there? Because, you know, there are lots of little things, uh, not little things, I mean, in, in the sense of being unimportant things, but there are a lot of steps that have to be, you know, filled in before they're all able to work and speak on the same level in the same plane. And nobody's asking for a new Anglican Reformation. We're asking for a new look at leadership, a new way to handle how Anglicanism uh, affects itself and affects itself globally. How are we going to be seen as global Anglicans? Um, you know, the theology works. Uh you know, as messy as it can be sometimes. But right now we have trouble with uh, some provinces who go off uh, off story. And how do we handle them? How do we hold them accountable as global Anglicans? And hopefully uh, the global South can do that. Now they've learned from GAFCON, George. They've learned um, a lot from what's happened with GAFCON and what works and what doesn't work in approaching uh, global politics here. Well, for example, in GAFCON, GAFCON had a moratorium on women bishops, mm -hmm. and it was broken by Sudan and then by Kenya. And in both cases, the and especially in the case of the Kenyan church, the the issue was that the uh, the will of the national church, meaning the the diocese and the people in the pews, was fully on board with women's orders. And that's, of course, due to Kenya's unique structures and part of being the East African revival. Mm -hmm. And Uganda also uh, is part of that uh, same worldview. But Uganda's held fast, but Kenya has just, Kenya's not been able to hold fast. And so what GAFCON learned is that don't make moratoriums if your structures are such that you can't enforce them. So in other words, if you say, we're all going to do this, and then somebody does something else that weakens GAFCON. So but in other, they, but in other words, all, we're all going to boycott. They, we're all going to boycott something. Right. But then somebody shows up. It, now, truth be told, they all agree to it. 
every nation at, you know that was part of GAFCON agreed that there would be a moratorium. The problem is it's not uh, structured at a province level. Uh, it's currently structured at a level of um, archbishops. And guess what happens every uh, couple years, George? There's a new archbishop in GAFCON. And therefore, mm -hmm. it's very hard to hold accountability uh, for the promises of previous archbishops. But these are things that I think can work themselves out over time. But here, one of the key things is, is the quality of the leaders we have. Um, there have been some phenomenal uh, Global South leaders. I'm thinking of Peter Akinola or Henry Arambe. And then there have been some duds. And the duds, uh, you can take two steps forward, then one step back. And that's the sort of process we're taking. Mm. And a lot of it is tied to the quality of the leaders of the provinces. So but I think what, GAF, what the Global South is, is trying to work beyond that and establish a covenantal relationship where we are all guided by the same, we're all on the same railroad tracks going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And we're not, you know, able to go off in our own little, little spur. My recommendation as a mild, humble guy here in the lower state of Idaho, make some built-in accountability. Okay, uh, bake it in uh, to this document you're gonna put out, uh, this covenant where we have accountability amongst provinces and amongst uh, archbishops so that you can say in the future, hey, you promised to do this and you didn't. Um, here is the ramifications that happen here. You know, we, we discussed mm -hmm. that when we were in Kenya, not Kenya, in Jamaica, uh, but it never got anywhere. They, they, they put a lid on it. This represents about two thirds of the Anglican communion, Anglican communion meeting in uh, Cairo, George. That's quite a, a, a bit. Yep. Yeah, and uh, we'll just see what unfolds. Jeff Walton is there, and he'll be uh, writing, and we'll be sharing his work, mm -hmm. and he's got an inside track as to what's happening, so I look forward to seeing his reports from the site. I hear he's the only journalist on site. I think they may have, they may have brought in one or two others, but ah, uh, Jeff is the Jeff only is, good Jeff, journalist on site, like I said. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. let's move on here and talk about story number two. Uh, the ACNA is having a General Assembly, Provincial Assembly, uh, in June in Latrobe, and right away we're starting to hear some, uh, uh, not noise, some, hey, while we're meeting together, let's talk about this. And Fort Worth has called for a moratorium on women's ordinations uh, when the new Archbishop of the ACNA is installed. Not bad, I suppose. What? Yeah. It, the Fort Worth Standing Committee put out a resolution, I believe on the 5th of June, yeah. from their meeting, uh, joining a number of other petitions and calls to have a moratorium on women's orders within the Anglican Church in North America. And what a moratorium is, is does not say all women are now no longer priests who are right. priests, but just we're going to freeze everything where it is right now until we come to a definitive response or conclusion, whether yes or no or what this or that is. And the, AC, the Fort Worth uh, resolution points out the fact that we're an impaired communion within the ACNA because we have dioceses like the Mid-Atlantic or Pittsburgh that have women clergy. And that we would necessarily be in communion, uh, be in impaired communion with their bishops who lay hands on women priests because they can't lay hands on our people because they are tainted. Uh, simpl simplifying it. Oversimplifying, yes. <laughs> so I, I don't want to call this jockeying for position before the uh, ACNA assembly, but they basically want to make sure that their views are not going to get swept away so that this will be addressed. Now, I'll put on my, uh, my uh, thinking cap, my agnosticator's cap, and say, I don't think there is going to be anything, because I just do not see, with the election of a new archbishop, unless it is so overwhelmingly clear that this is the call of the, the common mind of the House of Bishops, I don't think they're going to want to saddle somebody straight out the bat with a potential church dividing issue within they just may uh, want to kick the can down the road. 
within hours of the election of Archbishop Foley, these conversations were held with Archbishop Foley about having a moratorium. Um, and Archbishop Foley said, listen, we'll step back and we'll do this as a college. I'm, I, I don't, I, and I don't know his response. I don't know exactly, but I, I'm thinking he just says, you know, I don't have that type of power. This is something we're going to do as a, um, uh, a diocese, or not as, as a province, not as a uh, archbishop. And uh, he said, let's get together. We'll have this big um, get together of all the college bishops on the single issue. We'll vote for it, uh, for or against it. Uh, we'll have all these papers put together, and we will really study it. Guess what? They did all that. They finally had their women's order study. They uh, had a vote on it, and the vote was uh, status quo. You know, yes, it's an important issue. Yes, it's clearly outside scripture, um, and uh, but we ha it, it is currently institutionalized in the ACNA, and we don't know what to do about it because many bishops would uh, continue the practice, uh, many bish bishops would not, and we at the college of bishops level do not believe we should divide over that issue. So that's where we stand. And I. Don't expect that to change. I don't know. I, I think yeah. it'll get a good airing, but I think at the end of the day, the practical considerations will win out. Well, here's the greatest consideration of all. The grace with which Fort Worth handles this. They're not threatening to leave. They're not saying, oh, by the way, if you don't do this, we're out of here. No. They're saying, this is hard for us. We're in impaired communion. Can we do something about it? There were promises made when we formed the... ACNA that we would finally have a decision on this. We don't yet. Um, so we want to remind you that, hey, you, if you think everything's perfect, it's not, but we're not threatening to leave. That's kind of cool. You know, because what's the one thing all the prognosticators said? ACNA doesn't last uh, five years because of a Fort Worth. Well, so far they're wrong, George. So far they're wrong. Um, anything else? Uh, nope. So keep posted this channel. We'll certainly have news uh, coming uh, from Latrobe. Uh, I'll certainly try to get some interviews with some of the uh, the uh, people in the know, uh, Andrew Gross and others. Uh, I have requested, have not heard anything yet, I have requested to have the exit interview with Archbishop Foley, put him uh, in a seat in front of a camera for about an hour and talk about the good, bad, and ugly of being the Archbishop of the ACNA, um, but I've not really got any response back. Keep that in your prayers. If you know somebody at the ACNA who could help me get that interview, that'd be really kind of cool. All right, so the biggest news that we've been watching on Facebook and Twitter and else places is a C4SO parish has embraced pride celebrations. I have to be upfront with you. I attend a C4SO parish in Tampa, Georgia. I have always had a rule that we will not... Uh, disparage our bishop, okay, uh, good, bad, or ugly. And so uh, I will be uh, more careful than obvious with this story. However, uh, there's a church called Luminous, Luminous Anglican Church in Franklin, Tennessee. The vicar, vicar is Chad Jarnigan, and he lists his skills as an Enneagram instructor. And that is not a skill, George. Let's let's talk about this. Well, we'll I'll start with the facts on the ground. Okay. Uh, clergy in the Middle Tennessee area noticed that on the website of the Luminous Anglican Church, which is in Franklin, Tennessee, there was a pride flag or the pride colors. And they informed their bishop, Todd Hunter. Todd Hunter checked with uh, Chad Jarnigan. And he was told that, uh, no, this wasn't a pride flag. It was something less, you know, something else. And then Hunter said, do you support? And the C4SO stance on human sexuality, which is the ACNAs. And John Higgins said, yes. And so the website was cleaned up to make, uh, make sure there was no confusion on this point. Well, then the next week, the, the assistant priest, Heath McClure, goes attending a pride festival and he takes pictures of himself wearing a pride t-shirt and posts them on uh, Facebook or Instagram. And 
long and the short of it is the congregation and the clergy have figured out that the ACNA does not support pride agenda. And it looks like the congregation will probably be withdrawing and leaving the ACNA because of over this issue. Now, I have one or two questions. Who's minding, who's watching the gate? You know, both of these clergy are second career clergy um, coming, they don't have, they're wonderful second career clergy and they're wonderful people coming out of splinter groups into the ACNA. I'm not making any general statements. Yeah. But by the same token, who is vetting these people as to their theological and uh, pastoral acumen? And would Todd Hunter, I mean, can he with the straight face say, oh, a pride flag's not a pride flag, it's something else? You know, it's like saying, oh, well, a swastika, that's really just a Hindu symbol of, symbol of good luck that the Nazis took over. Yes, but today a swastika stands for the Nazis, okay? Uh, well, the pride flag, the rainbow, yes, it may come from the Abraham, uh, Noah, uh, Noah's covenant, but in the United States today, you've got to be incredibly naive not to uh, tie it into the pride movement, the gay movement. We have, th this story takes on different structures. First structure is how do um, honest priests and pastors enter into the fray of the queer, queer community to uh, reach out to them and accept but not affirm. We know that when you wrap yourself in the rainbow flag, you are affirming, okay? But you can be accepting without affirming. How do we get ourselves so we're still in the conversation? We still offer that transformational love in Jesus Christ. We still say that there's a, a solution where you don't have to follow uh, your desires and make your desires your identity. And you do that through Christ. But the second you start wrapping yourself in that rainbow flag, you move from acceptance to affirmation. And it is so easy for pastors to do that because they know if I affirm you, I'm in the door and I get to have that conversation. But you've lost that conversation once you wrapped yourself in that flag. It's a satanic flag. It's, it's not there for conversation. It's only there for affirmation. And we need to find a way that we can clearly identify a, the goal uh, of pastors and, and other ministers in reaching the queer community and doing so without uh, uh, entering the pronoun war, so, you know, as we speak. The second issue is we have a very successful bishop in planting churches. Todd Hunter is second to none in planting successful parishes for the ACNA. Okay. In that, there's some really good priests. I happen to go to a Tampa ch uh, church with an, an extremely talented, gifted uh, priest, uh, Bishop Benna from uh, uh, the former Diocese of Albany attends that church in the winter with me, and he's just, you know, awed by the, this uh, this priest and his skills at, at teaching and the new formulation of this this church in Tampa, and it's growing leaps and bounds. It already has a church after it already has a ch church building fully paid for after uh, two years of ministry um and as such there's other less vetted i i'm going to say that less vetted uh clergy that are chosen amongst the uh the province under todd hunter's authority that kind of mesh into this uh luminous area george and it's hard to watch there have been proposals uh, to basically uh, form more seminaries, you know, mm -hmm. form more seminaries so that everybody comes out stamped with the same common touch of Anglicanism. Sure. And I have to tell you, I know gay graduates of Trinity Seminary yeah. uh, in the Episcopal Church. I'm a graduate of Yale Divinity School. Uh, just because you go to a certain school doesn't change. You know, I was sent to Yale to broaden my uh, worldview by my bishop 30 odd years ago. Um, I had a wonderful time, but I am the person that I am and it, nothing was going to change me uh, because of my faith is in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really not 
that the calls for more institutions, you know, Trinity and Neshota House and all the other ones that are already there, reinventing the wheel at this stage is not a good idea, especially when residential education for seminarians is disappearing. Um, but what will never change is a bishop who really knows his clergy. So if you're looking to fill a spot and you need a warm body uh, that that has all these, that you can tick off all these boxes that they've done X, Y, and Z, but you don't know the fellow, you will get these sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. So you, this is always going to happen. There are always going to be a, a luminous Anglican churches popping up where the congregation and the priest really are not oblivious to what it means to be an Anglican. Well, okay, well, let, let's start with that. We'll go back to the formation of the ACNA in Plano. Uh, one day before the formation, Chuck Murphy says, hey, I'm going to appoint three new bishops uh, out of nowhere uh, that will be on team uh, Chuck Murphy before the formation of the ACNA. Todd Hunter, Doc Loomis, I forget the other one. Um, and it looks like a golf pro. I can picture I it in my know. head. I forget his name. Sorry. Uh, my apologies. It's not you. It's my memory. And so, uh, in a such, is this still, you know, a holdover from Chuck Murphy trying to, to hold power in the ACNA? Or, you know, I, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how this, this is working. Yet, I do see God using uh, C4SO and Todd Hunter and all that for good. Even though there's a lot of um, stuff that could be held to better accountability, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, just hear me out on this, uh, you know, uh, so that, that's my stay, my say, uh, will this, uh, church remain in the, uh, ACNA, George? No, I give it 30 days. Yeah. yeah unless they want to, I give it, you know, no, you... it, well, the ACNA has made it very easy for a church to leave with its property. So yeah. it's not. It's not going to take months. It'll take one meeting, the vestry, and then a congregational meeting. And they'll, if they, if the priests and the movers and shakers, you know, truly feel that they want to attend pride festivals and uh, be a pride church, then uh, I don't recommend the Episcopal Church because then they're they'll have to pay nineteen percent of their income instead of whatever it is, <laughs> C four S O. It'll cost them more. But uh, they certainly would be more at home with the Episcopal Church than yeah. the ACNA on this issue nationally. Uh, but the funny thing is, Tennessee, John Bauer Schmidt is actually a conservative, so you'd have to move to either West Tennessee or East Tennessee <laughs> or whatever it is. Okay, so um, we've talked about this a lot in the last six years. Uh, wokeism in the church, DEI, uh, you know, it's a mess. It exists especially difficultly at the national leadership level in the Episcopal Church, in Church of England, uh, ch just churches around the world, United Methodist, not just Tech and Anglicans. But somebody got called out for being a DEI hire. No surprise. No, no, no. Because I think one of the first bishops of the Episcopal Church of female origin was a DEI hire, but there was no such thing as DEI back then. So, Bishop of Dover called out as a DEI token. There's a story there, George. Rose Hudson Wilkin is a very controversial figure. I actually met her in 1998 or 99 at the World Council of Churches meeting at Porto Alegre in Brazil. Mm -hmm. She was part of the Church of England delegation. And she was a very aggressively crazy, uh, woke woman at that allegedly, time you know allegedly. White, white privilege <laughs> and racism yeah. and liberation theology and all this that and the other and she went on from there to become the uh, chaplain to the speaker of the house of parliament but there was a big fight because she wasn't also she wasn't also given simultaneously the job of uh, vicar of saint margaret's westminster we usually get the two in tandem but uh, the the speaker at the time was a bit of an SOB and he couldn't pull off a double double one like that. So she just got to be ch speak, chaplain speaker 
And so she got to be political without having to have any pastoral responsibilities. Then Welby made her the Bishop of Dover. And traditionally, the Bishop of Dover was the one who took care of the admin and the pastoral work within the Diocese of Canterbury because the Archbishop of Canterbury had these national responsibilities. Was not well, the Archbishop did... of Canterbury, Justin Welby, former Bishop yeah. of Dover? Yeah, okay. Uh, no, Welby had been Durham before Durham. he was Canterbury. It's a D. Come on. Right. And, and uh, well, after about a year or so, it wasn't working because Rose Hudson Wilkin was totally incompetent at her job. And so they took the flying bishop uh, for the South, for uh, South Southern England, and made it a suffragan for, Do for Dover, uh, for Canterbury, and created a new flying bishop post. So basically they had to find somebody to do the actual work that Rose Hudson Wilkins was supposed to do, but couldn't do because of her, she was incompetent. Well, People within the Church of England have been saying for years that this woman has no skills other than her DEI qualifications, diversity, equity, inclusion qualifications. Well, she was on BBC Question Time the other day, and she was asked questions about immigration being Bishop of Dover. And she said, well, we have to let these poor people come across in boats because France is not a safe place for immigrants, which is like, what? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, Charles Murray, who was a very, very influential writer, columnist, he's an atheist too, but he was interviewed on Sky News and talking about this, and he singled out Rose Hudson Wilkes, Wilkins as the Church of England's DEI appointment par excellence, a woman who got to where she got to, not because of any merit, not because of any innate uh, qualities in her uh, of character and intelligence, but solely because of sex and skin color and PC politics. Mm -hmm. And Welby has, Welby has, you know, from his chief of staff uh, down, has just drunk the Kool-Aid on DEI. And they're reaping, they're reaping the, uh, the benefits of it to have a, you have a total incompetence, so you need to hire somebody else to do her job. And now you've got uh, political commentators taking notice of the Church of England for how stupid its people are at the top level. But I, you know, I don't want to just limit this to the Church of England. Uh, the Episcopal Church has been doing this for two dozen years. You know, they have DEI hires, and um, I'm not going to name names, but there are people there who got the job because of their ancestral um roots or because of their gender and yeah and it's not and you know the next presiding bishop will there's a there's four people to choose from mm -hmm. and one of them is they have hispanic origin the origin bishop gutierrez of pennsylvania mm -hmm. and since we had a woman then a black man now it's a hispanic street it should be absolutely and and a, there's a fight for president of the House of Deputies between a woman of Native American ancestry, Hispanic ancestry, and African American ancestry. And the supporters are being marshaled along racial uh, lines. Nothing really to do with merit uh, or the abilities Skills. to get the fiscal church out of the, the deep hole that it's in, mm -hmm. but rather who, you know, whose turn is it? And the end result has been that the position of bishop, well, I can only speak for myself. I, I stood for election for a bishop and did not make it. I withdrew. Then in my own diocese, uh, I was put forward, but I couldn't sign off on the, uh, I, I couldn't allow we know. You, you, I mean, <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so basically that door is shut for me in the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. Well probably not a bad thing for me because if I did I'd I'd wind up like Bill Love or or somebody mm -hmm. out the door within a minute and I do enjoy what I'm doing right now but because of that the position of bishop does not have that degree of gravitas you know I don't expect deep theology from a bishop so I don't really expect coherence from a bishop Functionally, I'm a congregationalist in an, in an Episcopally-led denomination. Um, 
Is that how I started out? No, but that's where DEI has led us. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next uh, news story. Uh, Archbishop Justin Welby uh, went to Central America and yeah, we criticize uh, Justin Welby for his politics and for his inopportune, unvetted uh, uh, criticism of all people on Twitter. However, when he goes out to do Archbishop functions, like going to other provinces and encouraging them, I don't really want to spend time criticizing that. Um, but he's in uh, Trump land, so to speak, uh, uh, south of the border Trump land, El Salvador. El Salvador has spent uh, the last several years rounding up all the uh, uh, gang crime lords and uh, their fledglings and put them all in prisons. And if you want to Google El Salvador prisons and just look at the images of all these uh, uh, inmates uh, sitting on cement floors, uh, wearing only underwear, uh, completely encapsulated in a, a penitential colony uh, of the 1850s, that is what's happening now in El Salvador. Uh, the current president is pro-Trump. He's pro-capitalism. He's, um, he's like, the, you know, what we did for the last 80 years didn't work. Let's try something new. And what's new is working. The crime wave in El Salvador is less than the crime wave of New York City, Upper Manhattan. So well, it's working. <laughs> what will Justin say to that? Yeah, uh, last week Justin was in Guatemala and we had all the obligatory pictures of him in a big sombrero, you know, mm -hmm. the usual stuff. And now he's in I El Salvador. That. I support he that. Yeah, he, and he met with the president of Guatemala. Is he going to meet with Nayib Bukele, the 42-year-old president of El Salvador? Now, Bukele uh, was on the Tucker Carlson show the other night. And first, okay, if you're of a certain political orientation, alarm bells are going off right now. He was on Tucker Carlson. And he and Tucker Carlson had a love feast, love fest. Bukele has cut the crime rate by three quarters. Mm -hmm. He has turned the economy around and he was hardline stance on crime, uh, gave him an overwhelming reelection as president of El Salvador. And El Salvador has turned around under his leadership. And all the political stances, all the all the things that Welby is for in the political world, Bukele is against. So will we see Justin Welby give uh, pleas for human rights? Will he give pleas for, uh, you know, the usual stuff? Um, or are we just going to see more pictures of him in a sombrero, uh, this time with a Guatem with an El Salvadorian banner instead of a Guatemalan flag? Who knows? It's interesting whom Justin <laughs> picks fights with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, and because... And because uh, Bukele is despised by the American media, the corporate media in the United States. You don't hear much about him. He's despised by the BBC and the Guardian and whatnot because he is like the president of uh, Argentina. He's an unabashed Trumper, uh, the former president of Brazil. He's on the enemies list and he can point to being successful at implementing programs and policies, whereas all the people favored by the corporate media have been abject failures. So let's just see if Justin does anything interesting this week. Well, you and I as reporters hope he does. Okay. As sinful as that may be of us. Sorry. All right, George, um, back in the early, early days of Anglican TV, when I was uh, traveling the, the country as a uh, backpack reporter with a camera, a tripod, and uh, a, some, uh, a computer for live streaming, uh, I would say in 2006 or 2007, I got a call from a place called Tessum. And uh, one of the professors there said, uh, Kevin, we're having seminary for a day. It's a new thing we're doing. And we want to advertise Tessum, uh, Trinity Episcopal School for Ministry. Would you come out here and live stream that for us and uh, give us a little publicity? And I'm like, well, I'm so new. Any privacy for Anglican TV and Tessin was good. So I said, sure. And I went out there for seminary for a day. And I go, well, where is this? It's in Ambridge, Pennsylvania. Where the heck is that? <laughs> Outside of Pittsburgh. So I get on a plane and I, I go to 
uh, test them for the day. And what a wonderful campus. Modern campus, uh, good technology. Uh, every room had audio recording so they could record uh, their, their professors into podcast formats and stuff like that. Extremely impressive. And I've, since then, we've always had a, a relationship with uh, uh, TESM. Then it became Trinity School for Ministry uh, shortly after the formation of the ACNA, sometime in the mid-2015s, I think. Uh, and, uh, but they didn't publicize it. You would go by their little uh, placard outside the, the, the university, and it said, uh, they just whited over the E. You know, no longer Trinity Episcopal. It's now a Trinity School for the Ministry. We got a press release and a lot of fanfare last week from the, the press department there, the communications team, and it's now Trinity Anglican Seminary. The Anglican brand is worth uh, promoting, and uh, I... In this day and age, when most seminaries uh, are on branding themselves from their denomination, Trinity has decided uh, to to re to remain branded and attached to the denomination. Pretty cool, George. Yeah, Jeff Walton had an article on uh, that we've reprinted on uh, Anglican Inc., where he points out that this is goes against the trend. The trend these days, both for churches and for schools, is to remove denominational identification so the baptist's name is being dropped and methodists and things of this nature and trinity however is of the opinion that the anglican brand has marketing power uh, just be that vulgar um that the Ang the anglican and the see trinity has lutheran students it has a whole cross section of students mm -hmm. methodist lutheran and i think there's it, two orthodox students going there yeah and it's by offering uh, by changing its name to Trinity Anglican Seminary, it's basically planting a flag that Anglicanism really is the default non-Catholic religion. <laughs> I, I hate to put it in that such bold terms, but that's, that's essentially what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And they're confident that their marketing and that their ability to attract students from across the board uh, of the uh, Protestant tradition in the United States tells them that this war is working. So this is a good news story. This is a good news story. This is a reaction to marketplace dynamics, I would say, that's intelligent and basically uh, leveraging an asset. They're at a Anglican identity. Um, they got rid of the Episcopal name because it was hurting them in their identity, but now they're adding the Anglican and to leverage back up their identity. Well, let's play a little game here, George. Trivia. What seminary with the Episcopal name is still in business today? There, with the name in it, there isn't one. The interestingly, uh, we had a, a, a press release from the Seminary of the Southwest mm -hmm. in Austin. It used to be the Episcopal Theological School, Theological Seminary of the Southwest, but they've dropped the E, yeah. the Episcopal, from their name. Um, no, so basically, there's none left that has the name Episcopal in it that I can come up with off the top of my head. No, Episcopal is a ruined brand. You know, in 1990, it was an amazing brand. In 1970, it was the brand to be. Okay, they drove ovals. But to be Episcopal was, you know, rather, you know, cool. I was an Episcopalian then. And so uh, other than that, I think we've seen um, the General Convention of the Episcopal Church completely ruin a brand over 40 or 50 years to the point nobody wants to be called a brand. Now, I can say that because I have slowly watched all the Episcopal high schools and middle schools around the nation changed their name as well. Nobody wants to be named uh, Episcopal or have anything to do with the identification with that once amazing denomination. It, it, it's, it's like uh, um, unclean, unclean, you know? <laughs> so uh, more power to you for staying in it, George, but uh, what's the name of your church? Shepherd of the Hills Episcopal 
Church. So Shepherd of the Hills, good name for the future. It's a, all no, right, well, just for for brain. No, I mean we uh, <laughs> we we're like uh, we're like uh, Rivendell in the Lord of the Rings, with that last homely house where all is well, that you can come and be safe from the world collapsing all around you. Um, <laughs> You know. Uh-huh. All right, so let's there move on go. to some more news. Okay, uh, we reported I have uh, I had Dr. Ryan Danker on the show to do a Methodist Unscripted to really cover what happened in the last uh, two or three years with the uh, United Methodist Church, now a uh, General Methodist, uh, um, Global Methodist Church, and he covered it really well. I've gotten so many emails saying thank you uh, because we were in the Methodist Church and nobody told us anything. All we knew that there was some lawsuits going on, and we were trying to escape the church to to move on with our ministry. And now we finally have the story. And I want to thank Ryan Danker for his help in that. And I want to thank all the Methodists who uh, raised the numbers that single episode up to like 10,000 views. I I really appreciate that. Uh, And as such, there's still more news coming out of the United Methodist Church. Because now the ramifications of changing your definition of marriage and and sexual relationships within marriage is going to really hurt. 1.5 million um, United Methodists from the African Ivory Coast have said, we're out of here too. This is ridiculous. Why didn't you consult us before you did this instead of just blocking our visas from coming into America to help stop this atrocity? George, this is news. 1.5, and we're saying million have left the United Methodist Church in a single signing of a document. I think this could be up to almost 20% of their members. I'm not certain, but it's a significant portion. Uh, the United Methodists, uh, before the split, had, well, I don't, the numbers are a little fuzzy right now, but they have <clears throat> very large groups in the Philippines and in Africa and other places uh, that are conservative. And it was the overseas groups that really kept the brakes on the on the, the liberals in the United States. Well, the brakes came off and we've seen over a thousand United Methodist Church in the United States withdraw into, as Ryan Danker described, into the World Methodist Church and into Wesleyan Church. You know, it's all falling apart. The conservatives leaving. And now the Africans are holding their votes and the People in the Ivory Coast are saying, we're out of here. Now, Zimbabwe, its leaders, the Methodist Church there, said, well, we're going to stay in for a time. Well, Zimbabwe has a history of basically holding out its hand for money and taking the money from the foreigner and then doing what they want to do. That's how it is in the Anglican world. So I'm not surprised that the Methodists in Zimbabwe are following the Anglican model of being nice to Canterbury so long as it writes checks. But following an internal policy that is in line with the uh, GAFCON and Global South. But this is not a surprise. What is a surprise is that there are million and a half Methodists in the Ivory Coast. It wasn't something I thought about, but uh, this will continue uh, the shakeout um, because, you know, the people in the Ivory Coast are like the Anglicans in Uganda. They, at a certain point said, it's not worth taking corrupt money from uh, from the United States or from England if we're going to have to sign over our souls. Okay, well, here's another thing I want us to notice as Christians. The only Christian story to make headline news in the last 30 days was 1.5 million Africans leaving uh, the Methodist Church. It was in Daily Mail, New York Times. It was in all the major publications. Had a paragraph or two about it. They won't tell you everything, uh, but they, you know, that this is the last time I've seen a religious story make the rounds uh, of secular press in such a long time. Now the Pope will always make the press, okay? But you know, as far as a, a denomination like the Methodist, uh, this is it. And uh, the the secular world takes note. Um, I don't know what they gather out of the information, but, you know, some things will raise their, their eyebrow a little bit. Oh, 1.5 million. Let's look into this. So it's, a, it's an interesting story. We, we pray for those who are fighting for, uh, I'm going to use a w- weird w- uh, term together here, Orthodox Methodism. Um, but uh, we, we do pray for you. 
Uh, number nine, story number nine, calls for conservative ordinance in the Church of England to be given pastoral provision, depot, uh, to protect them from falling, uh, to protect them is falling on deaf ears. George. Yeah, I should have put a comma in there. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right. I read these verbatim. That's what you're going to get. Uh, the, uh, there's, the Church of England Evangelical Council put out a call to protect ordinance, people training for the ministry. Uh, from political persecution, uh, theological persecution, you know, people not getting placements, people not being allowed to be ordained because they don't agree with uh, the current fashions of gay marriage and this and that and the other. And the House of Bishops basically said, forget about it. And this is also, there's been calls for a uh, third province of structural differentiation where in essence you can be a priest in your church in the Church of England and you would be in a third province, not Canterbury, not York, but one that has a different canons on these human sexuality. So there are there's a major push among conservatives to say we want to stay in the Church of England, but we need to have leadership who is not going to continuously attack us and sap us and destroy us and tax us. Well, the bishops have answered effectively the same way, forget about it. They do that maintaining their authority, maintaining their hold, and maintaining the fiction that they can be bishops for all people. It's a, it's a, it's a self-delusion that many of these fellows have, men and women who are bishops in the Church of England, that they can basically minister to all people. That lie is something they tell themselves. And yeah. they're not I mean, willing to give that up. There is an amazing example of that lie uh, in Enoch Burke, uh, an Irish priest who is currently in jail for refusing to uh, participate in pronoun wars. School teacher, school teacher, school okay, teacher, school not teacher. a priest. Well, people call me a priest all the time. I'm going to use that, that, that power as well. So um, school teacher out in, in Ireland is still in jail after a year for refusing to uh, be uh, a speech Nazi. And he, he won't participate in the pronoun wars, and he's still in jail, George. We've had pushback from some of our viewers in Ireland saying, yes, but. Yes, Burke is standing on his principles, but he's a bit of a horse's ass. And uh, in other words, there's some people who seek out martyrdom, mm -hmm. and that, you know, his family has a uh, uh, history of being... For an American audience, he's a bit of a Fred Phelps type figure, a bit on the fringe. But that doesn't, I don't know Enoch Burke and I hmm. don't wish to judge him. And his, but his reputation is not squeaky clean. But at the same time, Kevin, your point is absolutely right. Here's somebody who's standing on principle, a principle the church would agree with. Yeah. And the church is silent. Right. Hey, regardless of uh, your messenger here, Enoch Burke, you know, Fred Phelps or not, uh, the laws should certainly be protective of him in speech. I mean, this is the land, the United Kingdom, where we started the Magna Carta. I don't know if I have to do a, a, a four-hour symposium right here, right now, about the Magna Carta, but we give each other uh, certain principles, dignities, and rights and not just uh, royal titles here. And I'm like, <sighs> so uh, I... I don't, here's a historical question. Would the Irish consider themselves under the heritage of the Magna Carta, or would they consider that to be an English intrusion? At the know. time, English intrusion. At the time, it was written, absolutely. But now, you know, they've had the ability to, to live under the Magna Carta for you know, many centuries, and I think they thousand years, a thousand years. I don't think they have a problem with it. Yeah, it was twelve fifteen was the Magna Carta a long time ago. All right, let's finish up with a couple of stories here. The Episcopal Church is preparing for its general convention, so the the loonies are starting to make some noise, which is cool. The ACNA is starting uh, to gather for its provincial assembly in Latrobe. Uh, we got uh, uh, the uh, Global South over in Cairo. This is going to be a busy month for news on Anglican.inks. Please 
go there and visit often. We we try to post those, repost those stories on Facebook when we can. Um, but this would be a busy news season for Kevin and George. Um, the, the, when I f- attended my first general convention, and this is the year that Shorey was elected, the, the presiding bishop who shall not be named, um, the most significant document they gave me when I got there was the, the resolution document, the, the changes we're going to make, um, and uh, the ideas that we have. And boy, that was a book. That was... I couldn't even put that. My, I left that in the hotel room. I couldn't carry that around. And so let's talk about upcoming uh, resolutions that are here to help the Episcopal Church, George. To help the Episcopal Church? I don't think there are any. <laughs> I um, the resolutions can be proposed by dioceses, bishops, deputies, and whatnot. And this general convention is far too large in the number of people attending to make it workable. And you get each diocese gets four clergy and four lay representatives plus their bishops divided into two houses, one of bishops, one of clergy and deputies. And so a diocese like Texas with 100,000 members will have as many clergy and lay representatives as the diocese of northern Michigan with 750 members. So it it's it is a uh, on its face, uh, undemocratic uh, place. And second, it allows failed politicians, wannabes, really odd and strange people who really get all worked up about issues to come and be a little champion for something that is important to them. So you get dozens of resolutions ranging from free mumia abu jamal from pennsylvania prisons to you know uh end the embargo against cuba every special interest group can get something there and most of these things are of absolutely no consequence whatsoever they're voted on and they disappear they never go away see them again uh a lot of the work in fight on these resolutions is passive aggressive mm-hmm. so for instance there's been a resolution <laughs> where uh to allow people to receive Holy Communion if they've not been baptized. This is a hobby horse of some group, sure. a small group within the church. <clears throat> and they had hearings on it, and the bishops didn't show up. And the, the requisite number of bishops didn't show up for that hearing, so that resolution couldn't go forward. So, you know, that was a passive-aggressive way to kill the darn thing. Another thing is we've got a resolution to get closer to the Methodists. And... The, the people who are really in favor of that are all keen because, you know, now the Methodists have gotten rid of their conservatives, their theological blood brothers to us, we Looney Tune Episcopalians. Well, that's not going to happen, I believe. I could be wrong. Because the Methodists allow deacons to celebrate at the altar, and there's some things the bishops are not going to let go of, and that who is can preside at the altar. And so that's going to die, I think, a death well, uh, yeah, or well, be so on. amended as to not not be allowed but this is the interesting thing about general convention it is literally a war between the emotional and the reasonable sometimes the emotional defeat the reasonable frequently yeah on uh, things it, that it, don't matter well no but it, eventually they do matter at, at some point uh the emotional uh will, will get wins higher up in reasonable matters that it affects the church the Episcopal Church, as we've talked about the brand, has been greatly affected by emotional people uh, battering reasonable people. Yeah. yeah. There is one resolution that I like. It increases the retirement age from 72 to 75. See, right now I have tenure of office. I can't be gotten rid of, save for criminal misconduct. Mm-hmm. Except when I'm 72, I have to have my license. I can stay on, but the bishop renews my license each year. Because of the shortfall in trained clergy, they're increasing the retirement age for everybody, including bishops, 72 to 75. So I can stay in post three years longer. And since I like what I do, I probably will. Uh, but without, so in other words, my freehold on this place will, will has been extended by three more years. Mm-hmm. And hopefully by that time, we will have uh, paid off our debts, uh, be fully entrenched in the community and be good servants of God. Sure. 
I mean, that's interesting having a an endpoint. I mean, we have a great example of why you should have re a retirement age in, in our president for certain. Um, uh, but you know, uh, clergy. I've seen very healthy clergy serve till eight, none, but ninety-two. I, I know a, a clergy person who served well into his his early nineties faithfully. He wasn't you know a, a pastor of a, a church, but what a reason theologian he remained. So, yeah, okay, let's wrap this up. I think that's about everything we need to talk about. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, just some squirrely stuff to talk about next week. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 861 of Anglican Unscripted.